George would, uh, George would go to church with Diane, but he went mostly for her. He wasn't so into this whole Jesus God thing as his wife was, but he realized he could see that his wife got a great deal out of it, and he figured that the church must be doing some good in the world, and so he would go to a mass with his wife, Diane. And so Diane and George are listening to the gospel being read one morning, and it's this precise gospel that we have heard this morning about the raising of Lazarus. And so George thinks, well, you know, I actually have a friend who uh, was dead, and then the doctors came and uh, put these things on his chest and shocked him, and he came back to life. So I guess I have a friend that has been resurrected. And so maybe the next time I talk to the priest, I'll tell him, I, hey, not only was Jesus resurrected, I got a buddy who was resurrected too. And then he also thinks, well, you know, I, the people then, those early Christians, they must have missed the Jesus who walked with them and lived with them and ate with them on the roads of God. They must have missed him so much that they were just so pining away for him to come back and for them to have that same experience over again that, that they probably, psychologically, they, they invented the idea that Jesus came back the way Lazarus came back so that they could experience that, they could experience that same Jesus again. And it's because he's a person of a psychological society, he immediately psychologized their early Christian's experience. And so that's his understanding of the resurrection. And of course, his understanding is utterly wrong. He doesn't seem to understand it at all. And so, firstly, George has never really had the experience, or maybe he had it and doesn't remember it, the experience of him feeling moved to an act of love and noticing that the source of that movement to love doesn't seem to be him. It seems to be a love that God has placed in his heart. He's never had that experience. He's never had that very spiritual, spiritual experience that we have all the time of noticing that some action that we are moved to take, we can trace it back and we can experience that it doesn't seem to have been raised up in us by ourselves, but by a love that is greater than our own love, a love that is not ours, that we don't own, that is the love of God, that is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is the gift of God within us. He hasn't noticed that in himself, or if he ever noticed, he's forgotten it. So, therefore, he doesn't have a sense that the early Christians who wrote this, and St. John who wrote this, and the people that it was written to, he doesn't realize that they're not, they're looking for a deeper spiritual experience. They're not about nostalgia for Jesus. There's, there's no trace. He's never read the Gospels trying to understand what the experience of the people who wrote them was. And so he's never noticed that there's no trace in all of the Gospels. There's no trace of nostalgia for the early Christians wanting the Jesus to be brought back to them who walked the roads of Galilee. There's no nostalgia for that because they are so profoundly, powerfully gripped by the experience that Jesus is here now, that the resurrected Jesus Christ is alive in their lives and is moving them by his power and his love. And so they don't have a nostalgia for the Jesus who walked the roads of Galilee. They have a hunger to go deeper into the experience of how the resurrected Christ now lives and moves and loves within them. And so this story is written for them so that they might have a deeper understanding of how to live the resurrected life, the life where we can notice, we can notice if we are attentive that the movement within us to be braver than we would, to love more deeply than we would all on our own, that the origin of that is the Spirit of God and the resurrected Jesus Christ who pours that Spirit into us. 
And so he doesn't, he can't really imagine that, um, he doesn't really notice that the raising of Lazarus and the raising of Jesus are utterly different. He doesn't really key into the fact that Lazarus has to die again. Lazarus could walk out of his, the raised Lazarus could walk out of his house a week from then and a Roman chariot could run over him and he would die again. But the resurrected Jesus rose to die no more. He doesn't realize that these are, what he doesn't see is that a resuscitated corpse is vastly different than a resurrected body of Jesus Christ. What he doesn't see is that they're completely different. Lazarus is raised to become the same old Lazarus. His illness is fixed, but he's the same old guy. Jesus is raised. He isn't fixed. He's transformed by the glory of God. His death is transformed into life. His crucifixion is transformed into a resurrection. And he's not just people who know him meet him and they don't recognize him at first. He can, they can be in a locked room and suddenly he's there in the room with them and then suddenly he's not. He still has his wounds, but his wounds are now healed and they can put their hands into the gaping spear wound in his side and into the nail prints in his hands. John is writing to a Christian audience who are experiencing the resurrected Christ and they want to know more deeply of what is the mystery of that. They want to go deeper into the life of living in that resurrected power. And so George wouldn't even be able to, he wouldn't be able to probably even imagine that this gospel that he's hearing read from our early Christian ancestors is a way of them pointing It's a way of them saying, this is a vague pointing. The resuscitation of a corpse is a vague pointing to the glory of the resurrection, which is utterly different, utterly, utterly different and filled with vastly more glory. It is the glory of God. And so they are looking for a deeper understanding They're looking to go deeper into the resurrected life. They want to go deeper into how the resurrection of Jesus is not just about changing a change that comes to Jesus Christ. It's about a change that comes to the whole world. That by the resurrection of Jesus, redemption comes to all in the world, to all of humankind. There is something incredibly glorious and deeply mysterious about God raising up Jesus from the dead that brings healing and redemption to all of us. And they want to, un- they want to go deeper into that mystery. Doctors can resuscitate dead bodies. Only God can resurrect. Only God resurrects. I had a man once tell me, when he learned that I was a priest. He said, oh, you're a priest. He said, you know, I've died three times and each time the doctors brought me back. So Jesus was resurrected once, but I've been resurrected three times. And I had to tell him, you know, sir, I'm sorry, but you were not resurrected. You were resuscitated. The resurrection is something vastly different. And so they want to know more about how the resurrection of Jesus Christ redeems all of humankind. How is it that the power of God can take a crucifixion and can turn it into a resurrection? And how then can he take the crucifixions in our lives and turn them into resurrections? And how can God take the evil in the world? How can the resurrection of Jesus be the answer to the evil of the world? The answer being God's answer which is to take the evil and to transform it through self-sacrificing love and forgiveness and works of courageous love, to take the evil and to turn it and to transform it and to heal it so that God gets good out of what was done for evil. 
that's the incredible mystery of the redemption of Jesus Christ. It's how God can heal the wounds of all of us. It's how God doesn't eradicate death. He doesn't destroy death. He transforms death into life in all of us. And that's beyond George's ability to even imagine. George cannot, he doesn't recognize it. He's not attuned to his own interior life. And so he's blind to God. George is blind to God. He doesn't notice on the inside when a love has been raised up in him that he is not the source of. And he doesn't notice on the outside what is more than meet the eye. And so he's blind to God. We are approaching Holy Week. And when we are invited into the mystery to go more deeply into the mystery of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how vastly different and more glorious that is than the simple resuscitation of a corpse. But how are we going to do that unless we have trained ourselves and attuned ourselves to notice in our own lives and in our own communities when we are moved to an act of love and we don't seem to be the source of it? There seems to be another source. It seems to come from a love that is a gift to us, that is a love greater than our own. If we can notice that as we go into Holy Week, we will be far more able to go deeper into the, the depth of the mystery of the resurrected Jesus Christ who pours his spirit into all of us and his love into all of us. How will we attune ourselves? How will we sharpen our vision so that we can become more attentive to the movement of love that we're not the origin of, but that God is the origin of? Last week I was present at the walkout that many of our students over at the St. Patrick's School participate, organized, organized, structured, and uh, participated in. And I was standing there and I was watching these young students and I, and it looked to me like young people who don't have much of a voice, with, at that age you don't have much of a voice, giving voice to young people whose voices were just wiped out, who were quiet, who were silenced forever, never to have a voice. They looked like young people who were giving a voice to those people, to me. I stood there and I watched them and I, they looked to me, it looked to me like young people who were fighting and struggling to have a voice, to find their voice in the world so that they could speak for an outpouring of caring instead of an outpouring of meanness. And I looked at them and I wondered, 